Bay uh, Executive Board is the report on authorizing designation of MTC officers as signatory for late accounts. This requires the action of two-thirds of the ABEG Executive Board. May we have a staff report, please? Anybody mm -hmm. want to give a staff report? Okay, I have a motion. Second. I have a motion by Haggerty, a second by McKenzie, to approve the authorization of the MTC signatories to for LAFE accounts. Any questions by executive board members? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And I think, and now we're going to for a right? I'm, I'm good. Uh, this is the MDC agenda for A. And uh, what I am going to do is to turn this over to the vice chair of the MTC planning committee, Ann Halstead. In absence of Commissioner Sperry, I am uh, <coughs> here. And the planning committee met on July 14th and 2017 and referred four items to the commission. Yes, and the ABAG Administrative Committee met on July 14th with the MTC Planning Committee and, and also referred two items to the Executive Board. And we will ask staff to provide a presentation on those items. <laughs> are, we, <laughs> are we dancing? <laughs> are we out? We're on to I think. Uh, Ken Kirky, would you like to talk, talk to us about those items? <laughs> yes, uh, Commissioner, I'd be happy to join the dance. Uh, Ken Kirky, Planning Director for ABAC and FTC. And as soon as the PowerPoint comes up, I will begin my presentation. Okay, so I am presenting to you on four documents. Uh, the final plan, the final EIR, which uh, we are recommending approval uh, by the executive board and the commission on those documents, as well as the associated transportation improvement plan amendment program, rather, in the final air quality conformity analysis that required the approval of the commission. So by way of background, uh, this is a slide many of you have seen before, perhaps not the picture, but the words, Plan Bay Area 2040 establishes a 24-year regional vision for growth and investment for the Bay Area. The adopted preferred land use pattern is a focused growth pattern. It focuses much of the growth for households in the three largest cities and close to the bay. All of it within the region's urban footprint. A little more than three quarters of the growth is within the priority development areas. It's a somewhat similar pattern or a pretty similar pattern for jobs. Uh, again, quite focused, not as focused in the priority development areas, but still the majority of growth would be in the PDAs. <laughs> And that is reinforced by the regional transportation plan uh, that undergirds this plan. 90% uh, of the funding is fix it first, uh, which supports the focus growth pattern. The 10% that is for expansion is in large part related to some big projects that would support uh, focus growth again. Some of the key projects are Barton Silicon Valley, uh, the electrification of Caltrain, the extension of Caltrain to down the street, uh, the Trans Bay Transit Center. Um, and a number of other key projects uh, that in this fiscally constrained plan we identified uh, funding for over this 24 year period. So as most of you are aware, there has been a lot of discussion about the performance of this plan. Um, there are five targets that we achieved. It does pretty well on environmental related targets. Uh, there are four that we are moving in the right direction on. And there are four that we're moving in the wrong direction on, and the latter are la largely related to the region's housing crisis uh, and the related issues of displacement risk um, and how that relates to uh, the disconnect between jobs and housing in the region. This has been a long process. It started in the spring of 2015. Uh, we have had a whole series of meetings. Uh, many of you, all of you, have been involved in some of those, uh, and we are now here at the final adoption in this special meeting. Through this outreach process, we have received a lot of input. Uh, we've had over 200 meetings. We've received over 4,000 letters, some of them online. Uh, and over 5,000 people participated in the plan process. For those of you who were involved in the first plan barrier, it's been nonetheless a very different process. Uh, and we've received a lot of really good input 
along the way. So the input uh, was received in, in, relative to what you have before you tonight, relative to the draft plan, as well as the draft environmental impact report. Um, for the latter, for the EIR, we provided a specific technical response to each and every comment. For the plan uh, comments, we provided a summary response at least for every comment, and those are outlined in the memos that you have before you. So some of the general themes of the comments received, um, again, not surprisingly, the number one issue that we heard about was affordability, and how affordability relates to displacement and the impacts it's having on people in the region. Um, there was also quite a bit of commentary about resilience and a need for more focus on climate adaptation and sea level rise and a more coordinated approach in the Bay Area relative to that issue, as well as continuing ongoing work that ABAG in particular has been doing relative to um, hazards and, and earthquake um, prone issues and uh, issues of that sort related to resilience. There have been comments received related to the impacts of growth on communities, both in the form of the lack of investment to support uh, affordable housing, to support transportation investments that would accommodate growth, as well as some comments related to uh, just resistance to growth and that the growth in the plan uh, may be too much for, for some communities. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. In terms of the response and the revisions, uh, You'll note if you look at the action plan, there's a lot of red line uh, language in the, in the plan that's before you. That's in part because we incorporated a lot of public commentary into the action plan that is before you. We also worked closely with community-based organizations and worked to incorporate their input uh, for more specificity in the action plan, particularly related to the housing crisis. Uh, we made some more technical uh, enhancements to maps and supplemental reports. And we also um, added some language to the final plan related to some of the challenges of accommodating growth in the region. So specifically, um, in terms of the action plan and the region's housing crisis, the first three items you have before you are largely related to action plan issues that we are working <coughs> to advance in part through the CASA process. Um, CASA is a convening of a combination of leaders in the business, equity, and environmental uh, sectors of the region, as well as elected officials. There have been a couple of technical committee workshops thus far. The first steering committee meeting will occur in late September. There are a number of commissioners and board members that will serve on the steering committee. Um, it's really focused on addressing the region's housing challenge in a way we hope that it hasn't been addressed before. Um, First and foremost, perhaps trying to take an approach that looks at regional solutions to the region's housing crisis that, is, that are somewhat akin to what the Bay Area has done in the transportation front when the state and federal governments weren't providing enough funding. Uh, there may be policy mechanisms that could be advanced that are specific to the nine counties. Um, we'll continue to work through our own processes at both agencies, but also related to CASA to advance state legislative and funding solutions and also to build on some of the recent policy successes, such as the One Bay Area Grant Program. Um, number three, to some degree, relates to number four, as the action plan commits us to evaluating uh, expanded policies that could condition transportation funding on housing outcomes. Um, five, seven, and six, five, six, and seven, are uh, in large part related to the planning program and the integrated regional planning staff, um, providing technical assistance around best practices, um, strengthening technical assistance related to both housing affordability and community stabilization, and also providing uh, better data and information to uh, local planning staff in the region. Around economic development, uh, we heard a lot, particularly from community-based organizations, about the need to focus on jobs uh, for middle-wage middle sector jobs. Um, and one of the ways that we hope to uh, move in that direction is through the comprehensive economic development strategy that's underway right now and under development. Um, that could lead to, if it is approved, an economic development district for the region that will allow us to bring more funding into the Bay Area, uh, to provide for more middle wage career paths, as well as to provide a stronger link between goods movement industries um, and some areas of the region that are currently under 
represented or not experiencing the level of job growth that some of the region has experienced in recent years. Lastly, as I mentioned, uh, there is an interest in really taking a, a more coordinated and, and stronger approach, a more coordinated approach relative to uh, sea level rise and climate adaptation. There's a lot of work going on in the region right now. Uh, but at this point in time, a lot of the commentary that we've received is that it's not well coordinated um, or adequately coordinated, and that is something we need to advance. Um, and along with that, uh, the, the, bottom the bottom recommendation uh, has already been approved by the commission. That's to establish a regional advanced mitigation program related to transportation projects in the region and resource protection for those projects. So, I'm sure everyone has read the draft EIR in detail. Uh, it is several hundred pages. Um, it provides a programmatic assessment of the plan. Um, it really looks at the environmental impacts of the proposed plan. It was released back in April. We had a public process related to that in three of our region cities. Uh, the comments all received a response, a detailed response, every single one that was received. And we also provided master responses on the eight issues that are identified here on the screen um, that were common themes of many of the comments that we received on the EIR. Finally, it includes a mitigation monitoring reporting program that essentially outlines how we would move forward in terms of mitigation, what the responsible agencies are, and what would be expected for that mitigation. And it presents the conclusions of the agencies in support of the certification of the final EIR that's before you this evening. The federal requirement related to air quality conformity is also uh, up for consideration by the commission. Uh, we did not receive any significant comments on the draft conformity analysis report, and there are no impacts related to the, the conformity analysis um, with, with which you need to be concerned. That's essentially the results of this analysis. Finally, in terms of the transportation improvement program that would be amended to incorporate the new projects in the plan any projects that are falling out of the plan um, and we have not received any significant comments on the draft tip amendment um, and no significant revisions were made to the tip amendment as well so lastly um, before i make the recommendation and open it up to public comment. I do want to comment briefly. You have received letters uh, related to the city of Brisbane's concern. Uh, they are similar to concerns we have received from several jurisdictions that do not support the growth allocations uh, for that community. And I wanted to touch on a couple of, of issues related to that topic. One is that uh, Generally speaking, as I think everyone knows, but it's worth stating, SB 375 does not mandate local uh, implementation of this plan. Um, that the legislation is very clear that this is a voluntary plan from a land use perspective. We have a growth incentive program that we use to incentivize growth. We utilize the PDA framework that's been nominated by local jurisdictions in terms of how the growth is allocated. However, there's no mandate on local jurisdictions to implement the plan. Um, at the same time, there's no mandate on the regional governments to essentially embody every aspect of every general plan in the region. Indeed, given the requirements of SB 375 for regional transportation plans and sustainable community strategies, if we did that, we would not be able to achieve the performance targets of the plan, um, including the greenhouse gas emissions. Specific to Brisbane, um, the Brisbane Valens area is part of a bi-county priority development area that was originally put forward with the city of San Francisco. The idea was to plan it as one place for housing and jobs. Um, it is well served by transit. There's a Caltrain station there. There's a Muni station nearby. It's adjacent to 101. And it also happens to be in a very job-rich, housing affordability challenge part of our region. Um, the number in the plan is in no way an endorsement of any particular proposal. It reflects the range of growth that is currently being contemplated because one of the things that we recommend through the planning process is not only what does a general plan say, but what might happen uh, through 2040. Um, it's a very large area. 
uh, and there will likely be a process that continues there that will be entirely under local control. Um, along with that, I think it's important to note that if an amendment was made relative to any growth allocation at this point in time, it would delay the process for this plan. Relative to the regional transportation plan, um, it would delay the process for transportation projects. Uh, we would have to open up the EIR again. We would have to uh, consider where an allocation might go. And what we recommend is that instead there is a commitment uh, for staff, along with working on the plan implementation generally, to work with jurisdictions that have concerns about gaps between local plans and regional plans to address that moving forward. This is a limited and focused plan. It may not seem limited and focused, but it does not include the regional housing need allocation. It has no connection to the next regional housing need allocation that will be considered four years from now. So with that, um, we are recommending that both the executive board and the commission approve the resolutions on the screen related to the final environmental impact report, uh, related to the final plan, and that the MTC approve the resolutions related to the air quality conformity analysis and the transportation improvement program. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that we have. So I guess I turn to the commissions and ask if they have any questions, particularly with regard to the, the first item, which is the final transportation air quality conformity analysis, um, item 4A on the MTC agenda. Seeing none, I, I would move uh, that. Excuse me. Uh, an MTC, do I have an MTC? Excuse me, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I'm trying to see where the comment's coming from. There you go. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Worth. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Worth has moved to approve the final transportation air quality conformity analysis for Plan Bay Area 2040 and amended 2017 transportation improvement program resolution number 4298, seconded by Commissioner Haggerty. Thank you. Now I need to ask if there are any public comments. I don't have any cards. So seeing none, I guess we probably I think we need to ask. Let, let I would like please. clarification. Yes, please. I'd like to know whether, are we taking these items separately? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. Um, there the first one and the last one, I believe, are MPC. The two in between are MPC and ABAG. So that um, if there's any confusion, I apologize, but that's the way it is. So, um, is there, we've got a motion on the floor and a second. Are there further questions or comments? Okay. Um, seeing none, I would say, is there, do we need a roll call? Is there any? The voice vote's fine. Voice vote, all right, thank you. So, uh, MTC, uh, would our secretary uh, ask for? A voice, just a voice vote is sufficient. Okay. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Thank you. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It carries. Thank you very much. And next um, would be the final environmental impact yeah. report for the Plan Bay Area 2040 MTC resolution number 4299 and ABAG resolution number 09.17. Um, Excuse me. I have a, a comment card. It's not clear from your procedure uh, what items you're taking and how you're taking public let, comment. Let's ask us on the agenda, actually. Yes. So, um, I have a comment card in. I don't know where it is. It's it's probably here under item 4C, which is the plan itself. <laughs> okay. I also had a quick comment on the air quality conformity analysis. It wasn't clear oh, how you were okay. going to handle now, public the comment. The agenda is item 4A, but we didn't have any cards on it. So please, uh, we've taken okay. a vote. It's, I don't think you need to rescind. It's just a very quick comment. Okay, please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, David Pilpel from San Francisco. Um, I will comment uh, in a, a moment when we get there on the plan itself. But just as to the air quality conformity uh, analysis, I just want to be sure that both boards are aware of the Cleveland National Forest uh, Foundation decision from two weeks ago, which doesn't have direct bearing um, on this plan, but it is a caution uh, to uh, regions in adopting uh, regional transportation plans as regards uh, air quality conformity analysis and uh, GHG so that your analysis and discussion um, going forward 
bears in mind what the state goals are and that we're uh, being consistent. I don't think there's any problem here. I think you're good to Thank take the action you that you it. take, but just so that everyone's aware of that decision. Thank you. Be aware of it. So then we'll move back to item 4B on the MTC agenda. And do we have a motion? I'll move it. Commissioner Hagerty, do we have a second? Commissioner Dutra Fenati. Thank you very much. Um, a voice vote. Is there any further discussion on this item? Questions? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. And then I think we proceed. Yep. A -bag. Now we'll go to the A bag um, action on the EIR. Any comments or questions before we <coughs> take a motion? Wayne, do you have a comment or question on the EIR? Yes, I, I need clarification. Um, so, I mean, discussion on A bag, I mean, sorry, the EIR and Brisbane, respect to say that we changed the numbers from what was put in the report of 40 some thousand units versus what their RENA approved number 236 units. If you go down, how does that, I mean, I don't understand how, if you're going down, how does that require opening up the EIR? The shift in numbers represents a shift in, in growth and all the associated impacts with that growth. So um, any substantial impact has to be reconsidered. Uh, it's a zero sum game in terms of the overall control total for the plan. So there's a consideration of where would where would growth go if it's no longer in a certain location. Uh, and then what are the environmental impacts of that? What are the performance impacts of that, including the greenhouse gas emission um, target and, and other targets? So it really reopens the whole consideration. Um, that is why in part we are recommending not to make that kind of change, but to work with jurisdictions that have concerns going forward, given that this is not a binding plan. Uh, the next plan will have RENA. Uh, this plan does not have an impact on that cycle at all. The cycle that is out on the street that jurisdictions are working on right now remains, um, and that that would be a much better approach than making a major change at this point in time, given that the numbers and the growth allocation are not binding on local jurisdictions. I understand that, but we're talking about a lower number. So how does that increase its greenhouse gas? Director, if you lower the number for one jurisdiction, you've got to increase it for somebody else. So the environmental impact report would have to study both of those changes. So it's not just a lowering. Any lowering has to be accompanied by a raising to keep the overall total the same. OK, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that, because you're talking about balloon effect. And I don't think that there is a balloon effect here. You need to build the houses or you don't. And the people, I mean, people come in regardless of doubling up, tripling up in houses already. So yeah. you're yeah. talking about, you're talking about saying that this 44,000 units don't build, built here, it's gonna have to be built somewhere else. That's what you're saying. Those are the rules under which this plan is constructed. I'm not talking about what happens out in the world. I'm saying <laughs> under the plan, we have to agree on a regional total and we have to assign that total around the region. So if we reduce it in one place, we've got to increase it somewhere else. That's our obligation. Okay. Mr. Kinnett. So Madam Chair, just a quick question. Are you going to uh, take public comment now? or um, I was This is the EIR. I have no comment cards for the EIR. I have comment cards for the plan, which is next. OK, so let me ask a question of um, staff. Um, Steve, no, Ken. Ken, let me ask you something. Um, what have you done? So I represent Brisbane, right? So I'm on board of supervisors in San Mateo County. And so I've heard from the elected family and the community that, and staff that they've been trying to work this out with you. And the numbers that you have are dramatically different than the numbers that were appropriated eight years ago. So can you talk to me a little bit about your communication with the city of Brisbane? Yes, so we met with Brisbane last fall. We met with them prior to the adoption of the final preferred scenario. At the adoption of the final preferred scenario, which was adopted by the Commission and the Executive Board, we were very clear, I think, um, that the numbers that were adopted at that point in time, the final preferred scenario, that that would be evaluated through the secret process and would not be subject to change without considerable impacts to the planning process subsequently. Um, in terms of working with Brisbane, we're, we're available to work with Brisbane. 
Um, this is not a dictate on what they are doing. It's not, it's not an endorsement of one approach or another. It is a recognition that this is a plan that is trying to deal with the disconnect between jobs and housing in this region. This is a priority development area that was nominated by the city of Brisbane jointly with San Francisco. For the Brisbane portion of the Brisbane Baylands, there was a range going up to 4,400 <coughs> units that was part of the original application um, eight years ago, um, or seven years ago. So there has been communication, and as I said, we would be happy to work with Brisbane going forward and other communities that have concern about the growth allocations. So one follow-up question. So why do you think um, they're here tonight. What, what, what do you think happened on the communication? Because what I'm hearing from the city in my district, and um, all politics is local, right? So all politics. So why do you think that there's so much confusion? Why do you think that they don't feel like they're being heard? I can't speak for why they feel that they're not being heard. There hasn't there hasn't been a request or a phone call that we've received that hasn't been answered. Let me, let me try to address this a little bit differently from a different standpoint. Um, when we do, in 2013, when we did our plan that included the RINA numbers, we had an 18-month process, maybe a little longer, that incorporated a housing methodology committee where we met for an extended period of time, evaluated criteria, what were the factors that were going to go into assigning the housing numbers for every jurisdiction, and how would those be balanced. That was a public process. Um, it was somewhat painful at times. We have done that for the last, I think, three cycles before this. We have had that same kind of a process. This time, because we now go to an eight-year RENA, effective with the 2013 plan, we don't have arena again until the 2021 plan. However, we are mandated to have a sustainable community strategy in the meantime. So the decision was made at the beginning of this cycle, because we don't have the onus of the arena numbers included in this cycle, and we don't have to come up with those mandated numbers that we would try something completely different. And we decided to use the urban sim model, which is a market-driven model, to give us more of an economic analysis of what the potential is according to the market. We all have frustrations that, <coughs> given our arena numbers, we try to pass a plan, and we allocate um, our housing opportunity sites, we beg developers to come and build, they tell us in some of our regions, nope, we don't want anything to do with you. It's, it doesn't pencil to build in your community the way you want it to. So in this, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ken or Steve, either one of you, but in this cycle, we thought, let's take a different approach. Let's look at what the market would build if the market were in charge. Market forces drove where the development went. And so that was part of the analysis. The, the other part is we are using as complete information as we have available from all the jurisdictions. All of us who saw the initial maps know there were some mistakes here and there. We didn't have accurate information on every single parcel. And Ken can give you a better description of how the modeling was done. But that's where some of these numbers come from. We are not obligated in any way to build these numbers. The only numbers we are still obligated to, and I checked with Ken earlier today, in the case of the city of Brisbane, your 2013 RENA number total was 83 units. That's your RENA number for you to try to meet by 2021. And and one of those things we've always used in the past is how well did you do on meeting your last target? And if you did really, really well, you didn't get assigned quite as many the next time. Your proportion might have changed. Can't guarantee that would be the same criteria this time, but it might be. Um, in your um, term from 2007 to 2014, that number was 234. 
of which you met seven. But in, in uh, 2013, your number that was assigned is 83, not 4,400. That's what the market says might be built. But that does not obligate you. This does not support any particular <coughs> development proposal in any way, shape, or form. This plan is a suggestion of how we might build out if we followed market forces. It's a good educator to us of what could happen and how we could accommodate those numbers, theoretically, that the market would actually build. Does that mean all our local communities are going to agree? Not a chance. We know that. We're all elected officials. We hear those folks talking all the time. So that's not going to happen necessarily. For the 2021 plan, I am sure we will again have that painful process of the Housing Methodology Committee. We will go through that process and we will come up with a different allocation. We will probably have a higher number that we have to distribute, so we'll all feel a little bit more pain, I'm sure. But we will decide that together. So I want to assure you that there is no endorsement of current project proposals in this. There is no mandate that this is a number that you have to meet. I'm willing to give you a letter to that effect as the president of, of ABAG. Um, I, I think it's really important that we understand what this plan is and what it is not. Ken, correct me on anything I may have mischaracterized. Um, president, I don't think there's any mischaracterization. The other component of this is SB 375 mandates that there be a sustainable community strategy, a vision for how a region is going to grow that reflects a change from how urban California has grown in the past, that when integrated with the regional transportation plan and all of its investments, achieves performance targets and produces a different result. And so trying to address the jobs housing disconnect in the region has been the primary issue all through this process of the last couple of years. And that drives the distribution and it drives the heavy focus on priority development areas and trying to sync up jobs and housing in key locations where there's an opportunity to do so. That's the regional perspective, which is not always the same as a local perspective, particularly at a given point in time. And that's a lot of the tension uh, that you all deal with in, in this process. So that said, and understanding that as we go forward with, with the EIR, that any change to the numbers at this point triggers a new analysis because it has to go somewhere and those impacts would have to be studied. We would... Madam Chair, I have a quick question for you. Madam I'm Chair. Sorry. Yes. I have a quick question for you, just for, for clarity. So what you're saying is that number, 4,200 or 4,400, that, that number means nothing then. Is that what you're saying? No, that's what it's, you're, no, what I'm saying is, according to the model, that's where the market would build units if all other factors were in favor of it. Okay, so If it weren't a contaminated site, if it weren't, uh, if it was something that the community supported. So, okay, so if that number says what you say it, say it says, then say if we were to adjust that number down to 230, what's the difference? The difference is the rest of those numbers have to go somewhere else in the region, and another community has to absorb them, and the traffic patterns change, all of that. And we would have to reanalyze the impacts of where that growth is allocated. And I guess my, my concern is, it speaks to what you just said, is the burden that you're putting on one city for all this housing. I mean, there is no burden. There is a burden because what you had just said, what you had just argued, um, Chair, is you had said that we were going to move additional housing to other areas. That's the argument you tried to frame. What I would challenge you to think is to say, why are we putting or planning to put, not planning to put, but visioning in the future 4,400 units for one community? To me, that just doesn't seem right. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Pat Eklund and then Wayne, and I'll come over to this side. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Brisbane, uh, the city of Brisbane, wasn't able to work out some of the numbers differences because this is the, we the, we used a different model this time in arriving at the housing and jobs numbers. 
which was problematic for more cities in the Bay Area than it was in 2013. Because I went back, I was on that housing methodology committee and um, uh, for this last time. So the model that we're using, that we use this time, is different. And not, some numbers were higher for a lot more cities. And um, when we, some of the data was corrected in the database, some of the numbers did change, but nevertheless, so we are saying, staff is saying that it is too late for us to make the adjustment this cycle. You said, Ken, that this number of 4,400 is not going to affect at all the arena allocation. Uh, and I have two questions. One is the fear, I think, that Brisbane has, and maybe some other cities too, that weren't able to successfully get their numbers adjusted, is that this is going to become the base with which the RENA allocation then would be based upon. So you're saying that this number is not going to be a base, this number is not going to be a factor at all in the housing methodology um, the, that we end up coming up with. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, the RENA process, which, which occurs every other cycle, so right. not this cycle, but the next cycle and the last cycle, under SB 375 needs to be consistent with the long range plan, with a long range allocation. That said, it is arrived at, is delivered from the state of California. The state of California will give us a number based upon regional housing need that they go through a process and they send that out to every region in the state. The councils of governments in every region <coughs> takes that number and then distributes it, allocates it to the jurisdictions in their respective regions. There's, there's not any connection to this to this plan that you have before you tonight in terms of the allocation. Okay, so I've been on two housing methodology committees and we've come up with a different methodology of how to come up with the arenas. I don't know what we're going to come up with this next cycle. But isn't it also true if the city of Brisbane um, nominated this area as a priority development area, Aren't they also still allowed, and there's still a room for them, or time for them, to withdraw their request for a PDA? There is. Um, there, there's an opportunity to adjust them. There's an opportunity to withdraw them, to change, change the configuration. I mean, this, this priority development area was considered in part because it has tremendous transit access, because of its location in the region, uh, that it would be an opportunity for San Francisco and Brisbane to jointly plan this area. This is a several hundred acre area, you know, a mile and a half from San Francisco Airport between Silicon Valley and San Francisco. So it, it is something that any model that's looking at land capacity in a region that is uh, very job rich and very housing poor, and the jobs and the housing tend not to be near one another, any model would look at this area and say this is a priority area for development, and it was nominated as such by the city of Brisbane and San Francisco. Right, but uh, the cities also have the authority to withdraw a PDA request. They have total authority. And, and um, the housing methodology that we arrived at, at uh, uh, for the last uh, arena allocation did factor in additional housing if you had a PDA. That's correct. For the last allocation, that, that was the methodology that was arrived at. The prior allocation, the PDAs had been created and the PDAs weren't explicitly called out, and that's something that this Housing Methodology Committee and ultimately ABAG will consider when it adopts the methodology, whether or not the association wants to do that. Exactly. Okay. I, thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to come down to the table in front of me. Carlos? Actually, East Palo Alto and Brisbane are actually bookends in our city. We happened to fall into the same um, issue when you were doing the last um, RTP, in particular, East Palo Alto is a precise plan um, for our, which you partially funded, where we are looking at developing up to 2 million square feet of, uh, of office and um, an additional 1,000 units of housing. Um, and that, you looked at those numbers, those were the, even though we had not approved it at that time, you were analyzing um, uh, potential development based on um, policy direction that uh, city councils were at that time uh, considering. So I see this 
as something similar. But I, I also would like to point out though that the 4,400 number, and Urban Sins um, actually looks at a, it's a, it's a very complicated algorithm that looks at both transportation, looks at housing, looks at job development, and tries to figure out what are the impacts of those and whether or not they can actually occur as proposed. I think the 4,400 uh, number, if I understand correctly, is not an urban city number. It's actually a number that was derived from an advanced planning document that hasn't been approved yet, but that had been made public. Is that correct? That's, that is correct. Um, and it, it's, so it's not it's a the 4,400 is not a magic number right. for a site this large in this particular location. Um, you know, there are several thousand jobs that are also being considered for the same area. It's a it's a very strategically located location, um, and it's very critical uh, from a vehicle miles traveled perspective, given its transit access, given its location relative to a lot of job-rich communities, um, in, in communities where the job housing ratio for all of the nearby communities is, is quite imbalanced. So, you know, if Urban Sim were left to just look at the land area and this particular location, it could arrive at a much higher number because it's nearly 700 acres. Um, so, and so continuing on uh, with this discussion of the of Rena's Housing Methodology Committee, I, I <coughs> think this is correct. The Rena numbers do not come, from, they're not locally derived, they're derived from the state. HCD sends them to us. And the allocation process is one of whatever the numbers that come from the state for this region then get distributed through what we believe to be, at least in this Nine County Bay Area, um, a, a relatively equitable allocation process through this committee. So we would not be tossing new numbers on a community of the HCD that would be saying these are the, the projected growth numbers. When HCD does that, they indeed will be looking at plans on the ground and certainly expected growth based on both the economics, um, um, you know, density, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm, it would seem to me that, that the, four, and again, all land use is local. Let's make that really clear. There is, we cannot, neither ABAG nor MTC can impose, we, we cannot impose local land use decisions on cities. So I, I, I just I wanted to make that clear. I, I, I know that that 44 number, that 4,400 number, I think maybe you're wrong, maybe a little higher, a little lower, um, may seem high. But as far as I'm reading this, it is not an imposition to develop those units, correct? It is an analytical number used within the analysis, the EIR analysis, to see what are the impacts and do we meet the preferred scenario goal. That's correct. It's part of the part of a vision of blueprint for how the region can grow more sustainably. Um, the growth allocation, how it relates to the transportation investments, how they collectively perform. That's correct. Thank you. David. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, David Rabbit. You're Dave. We'll get to you, Dave. <laughs> no, thank you. I think some of the questions I had were answered. So it is within a PDA that was offered by the city of Brisbane in conjunction with the city of San Francisco. I think, uh, you know, quite frankly, the, the way the market analysis or the market approach that we took with that number 4,400 of an unapproved project that I assumed is proposed at 4,400 is somewhat problematic or unfortunate that it's the same number because I think it does imply that at least a regional body it gives leverage to someone that is trying to get something approved and I, I, you know that's a bit unfortunate because we always talk about the local control which I, I totally agree with and everything that was said uh, by my colleagues I think is very true in that um, going forward but again within the plan uh, plan development area which I assume had either a specific plan or is within the range of what would be required or densities of the general plan correct that 4,400 is somewhere within there. It's either going to, I don't know if it's at the high end, uh, low or middle. Um, it, it's, it's one of the alternatives being considered by the city through the current planning process, and it's at the high end. Okay. Um, and, and again, I think it's just that, that that number being what was proposed but has not been approved and gone through the vetting process. Uh, 
seemingly is the issue. And I, I don't, I, again, not having a, uh, having that range that's, that's required out there. There are very few general plans that are ever built out to the maximum densities that, uh, at least in the, I would imagine most of the jurisdictions throughout the Bay Area, at least, uh, that maybe that me uh, methodology that took that into account might be more realistic uh, going forward. I mean, they, this area, is, it is a specific area. It, it's, it's a large area that's being contemplated for a range of development. Um, I mean, let's be honest, it's a very controversial plan related to the city of Brisbane, and that's part of the reason why it's, it's garnering a lot of attention. Um, I think it's a fair point that it's probably unfortunate that the high end being contemplated by the city is also the developer's alternative because it, it's, it's raising alarm calls. That's not what the number is based on. It's as was described by board member Romero that when there isn't a particularly for a priority development area, when there isn't an adopted plan threshold that's been put forward by the city, when there is a planning process in place, and we are working to come up with a sustainable approach to growth for the region, particularly in key lo locations that are relatively per capita low BMT locations, one of the things that, that is assessed is you know, what's being looked at, what's being contemplated. And with the backstop, the, the jurisdiction isn't required to implement that. But if a higher level of housing, along with a high level of jobs, were both advanced in this area from a regional perspective, that alignment with the transit investments, and there's more coming that are in the plan, that that could be good from a regional perspective. It doesn't require the local jurisdiction to do it. But the regional point of view on that type of development is that's in large part what the plan is about. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz, and then Dave, and then Lynn. Uh, thank you. Uh, two comments, maybe three comments related to the Brisbane discussion. Uh, if we, uh, when we go forward with a motion on this, um, I might uh, encourage a uh, minor amendment to say that um, the chair would issue a letter to all cities um, that indicates that this is non-binding because I think the Brisbane issue and for the rest of us is would a developer or a legal team put in place an assumption that this is in fact binding or expected and we would lose leverage. So I think we need the assurance of the intent of this as an analytical tool uh, to understand. So I think that that would be very helpful um, to all of us. And uh, the other comment is, it is, will this information, did I understand the presentation from staff correctly, will this information be used um, to determine who gets grants? Because it, the comment was made, that it's voluntary, but their growth incentive programs would um, non-compliance with anything in this document or plan, <coughs> or plan preclude cities for receiving. I know there's criteria, but would this be a prohibited criteria if we don't comply with this? We'll ask our executive uh, director. Director, our our primary uh, incentive program is called OBAC, the One Bay Area Grant Program, and as you may know, um, it has. It, it's sort of a trade between regional and local government, if you will. Uh, local government gets a lot of flexible money that they can spend in lots of different ways for transportation improvements. And we try to get some gains in regional policy areas. Um, so one of the requirements in the five large counties is that 70% of the money coming to the county be spent in priority development areas. So for example, Director Eklund's question, what if Brisbane withdrew from the PDA program? Well, then they wouldn't be eligible for that 70%. But even with 70% dedicated to PDAs, that means 30% isn't. Um, and so other cities are eligible for those funds. In the North Bay, it's 50-50. So I, I think depending upon the circumstances, Brisbane could continue to be eligible for uh, that, that grant program that would come in San Mateo County through the city county association governments. So I, I think it's important for all of us to understand that there is a nexus between uh, what this document does say um, and what resources we would have for applying for grants. So it's, it's not as benign as we might uh, wish it was. Um, and then the other uh, comment I have is a comment I made um, last fall, and I, I couldn't find it in the EIR. 
uh, it was a little too many pages to go through and, and search for what I was looking for. Uh, there were two comments I made earlier. Assumptions in the preferred plan uh, that were X number of housing units would stay available in the housing pool for X number of years. It was like 50% of all the affordable housing built would be available in the housing market for 50 years. You know the criteria I'm referring to. In the environmental impact report? Well, I'm, I'm asking for the validation of that and one other assumption because the environmental impact report is based on the numbers. It's similar to the same question of if the numbers go up and down. Um, so I'm just validating the assumption of of the plan that the EIR rely on. There's there's a general assumption in the plan relative to affordability, and if new affordable units are coming online through whatever funding program they have, if the that that length of time is the estimate on average that those units would remain affordable. So, so is it uh, of, of all the affordable units, they would be available for 50 years? There's an assumption that some that the deed restriction is only going to go so far. Okay. So that's the estimate that's made region one. Okay, and the comment I made was that state law is not consistent with that assumption. And I didn't see the EIR addressing that. They may not have to, given the wiggle room we're using here. But I just wanted to reiterate um, that I made that comment and I didn't um, see a response to it. At least I wasn't able to find it. So it's important to realize that state law isn't in sync because there's a new state law that says um, under certain programs, the affordable units built can be sold at market rate and then are removed from the um, affordable housing stock. So um, it wasn't that way. Um, and I know in my community, we're slowly losing our units. And if you have, just as an example, if you have a million dollar unit, it's bought for $500,000, it's sold in two years for the million dollars, we split it 50-50, the uh, owner gets 250 cost share, or profit share, and we get 250. That 250 will never replace the million dollar unit we're losing. So I think that's an important ongoing thought for everybody. And um, I think there was the second assumption about how many units would be affordable. So there, there are assumptions that relate to the fact that it's a very big region. There are assumptions relative to this issue that relate to the fact that there are different types of affordable programs right. that allow units to be affordable. Therefore, there's a variance in terms of the longevity of the deed restrictions and so forth. Right. But the actual number, there was an assumption that 10 or 20 percent of all units built would be affordable. And that assumption is based in part upon that it's a long range plan. And a key part of what you have before you tonight is an action plan that's intended to address the affordable housing crisis and really try to get a lot more resources than we have at this point in time for affordable housing. I understand that. I'm sorry. My question is, what was the assumption number? Was it 10% or 20%? 10%. Okay. And so I'm just offering again that some of state law is not uh, in support of that. It actually uh, conflicts with producing that. Um, some of the state law, particularly for density bonus, allows density bonus incentives for developers that actually produce no additional units. So I just offer that as two significant cautions as we use this tool um, to understand the potential. And that's why I think it's so important that we get a letter that stipulates that this is a tool and information. Um, it does tie to grants but it's not something that a developer can fall back on and say, you have to do it. Okay, um, thank you. Dave? Uh, thank you. First, I appreciate everyone's patience for listening to this uh, San Mateo issue. I think it's important, just for the record, for everyone to appreciate that the staff has worked really hard for a long time to try to bring this to the ground. They wrote letters to ABAG on May 31, 2016, October 7, 2016, June 1, 2017. They, they held meetings and, you know, they were, I think this could have been addressed uh, at the staff level, but we are where we are. Um, and it is a very controversial project. And, and, and the city's con concerns, we're aware, is that this number 
requires some kind of endorsement. Um, it's been stated that we can't lower the number without upsetting the EIR. It seems like it'd be de minimis, but if that's the rule, that's the rule. So I mean, perhaps another way to address this would be to uh, footnote the 4600 number and add language to the effect that um, uh, the number reflects a proposed specific plan that includes approximately 4,400 residential units within the Brisbane Baylands. Currently, however, the City of Brisbane's general plan prohibits housing within the Bayland site. I mean, those are the facts on the ground. I mean, as, as the facts today is there's no right to build there. There's a proposal. So perhaps that would be a way to uh, get through this. I'm seeing our general counsel shake her head no, that that's not an acceptable thing to do. Why not? Well, I'm not positive it's not an acceptable thing to do. I'm looking at our CEQA counsel because I don't know what the effect would be of adding a footnote like that. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Ms. Thomas can. I guess the question is, if you did that with everyone that wasn't currently approved, then you don't have any solid numbers at all. Perhaps that would be better reflected in a letter to the city. I, I agree, a letter to, is that all? I can't no. tell. No. Okay. Uh, a letter to a city might be a better way to move. Um, I think if we start chopping away at our total control number, um, it's going to call into question our ability to house all the population, which is the obligation under SBP 75. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. We appreciate that. Dave, did you have something else? Again, the, my hope would be that you, the number would stay unchanged. It would just uh, give the reader some, some context. OK. Thank you. Lynn? Well, uh, well first of all, I wanted to just say thank you. To Turn your mic on, please. There you go. I'm kind of new back uh, again. I was a day back for many years uh, before I retired from being a mayor and came back foolishly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I uh, want to thank uh, both agencies for the cooperation we've gotten out in the hinterlands of Solano County, particularly the city of Ackerville. And, and DC has uh, supported our projects in a great way, and I appreciate that. And the APAG, I understand, it really has a dilemma with the housing. I'm almost willing to accept those kinds of numbers, but I have uh, concerns about uh, the jobs because the housing jobs balance is just completely out of whack. Six jobs per housing unit in San Francisco and barely one for one in uh, Sloan County. That's, that, uh, and we have a PDA, but that still doesn't do the job. Right now, even during the week, Thursday, Fridays, and Wednesdays, uh, traffic is unbearable on I-80. You can't get around. You can't leave the city. My wife has appointments down in Stanford, and I can tell you it is a zoo. It really is. It's uh, incredible the amount of traffic that is in our area, just getting out of town. So my concern is how are you going to really affect the job where they go? Is it because of the zoning within the, the Bay Area, the urban area, particularly San Francisco? I mean, why don't we uh, ask them to... Uh, change some of their zoning so that they put more housing up because six jobs per housing unit is really out of whack. And we do need jobs out in our area. It would prevent a lot more traffic off the roads, I can tell you that. And as an example, last night I ate in one of the fine restaurants out on in Fisherman's Wharf. My server happened to be from Vacaville. Today I took a ride, not in a taxi, but one of the other kind of lifts that you get. And the guy was from Sacramento who drives me. So, you know, there are a lot of people come down here because there's an excess of jobs. We've got to do something about that jobs housing imbalance. We'll, we'll accept our housing allocation, but we certainly have to have some work on putting jobs into our uh, Solano County. Most of the times when they leave uh, this area, they actually go to Sacramento. They just bypass us completely because they want to be in the bigger cities. But we need to do something in trying to help the cities out there get jobs so that we don't have to have everybody come here and uh, that would be a big help for us. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yes, if you're done speaking, put your cards down, please. I do have 
Oh, did you have another comment, Wayne? Yes, thank you. Uh, second by Apple. I do. Um, I do have uh, speaker cards as well for the audience. Uh, did you want to? Well, I, I just just the point. Oh, okay. John. Just the point of uh, the clarification on the process. Are we? Are there, are there going to be continuing comments on the plan, or we're at the EIR? We're on the EIR. There will be comments on the plan as well. I'm going to take um, the rest of the board comments. Um, the commission has already acted on the EIR. We're waiting for the ABAG executive board to act on the EIR. We do have some speaker cards on the EIR that we need to uh, hear from from the audience. And then we will move, after we approve the EIR, we will move to the plan itself. Okay. Thank, thank you. So um, I'd like again to thank staff. I know it's, it was a difficult process. It was a long fob and it took a lot of work. Um, and I want to say that I'm not, I'm very appreciative of what you've done. I know it's been frustrating for everybody here. Um, and I heard, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Bradley, for your comment. And that's what really concerned me is that in my case, in my city, you know, Millbury has the largest transportation hub and we're going through um, a lot of uh, building of affordable housing. And some of the developers have come up and said, well, it's in your EIR. It's just in the EIR. So it's not an official document. The EIR is an official document. So they're going to use those numbers as though it's part of the Bible. So that's my concern. So I'd like to see that letter also address the EIR and say, hey, these numbers that we're putting in the EIR and for the Bay Area Plan 2040 are not, doesn't obligate the cities to these numbers. And the ERR, even though it's based on those numbers, doesn't, still does not obligate any cities to, because contractors have come up to our city and said, hey, it's in the EIR. Mm -hmm. So um, I would appreciate that that letter included that. Okay, thank you. We're going to move to public comment, and I have four speaker cards on the EIR. Uh, you will have two minutes each, and Cliff Lentz is first, followed by John Suecki, and Denise Louie, and then Scott Lane. And one more. Oh, that one's already here. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Cliff Lentz. I'm on the Brisbane City Council. Uh, I was in this room last week. I spoke to quite a few of you who were on that committee. I've written a couple of letters. Uh, and our city has written multiple letters, uh, all of which um, are in protest of the 4,400 units that are applied to the PDA uh, in our town, primarily for the Bruce Bain Baylands. Uh, you know, I'm not against the plan. In fact, I think the plan is excellent, and I, I you know, I, I think it's it's the right thing to do for the region as a whole. But you know, what I'm adamantly against is the uh, is the plan getting ahead of our city and our citizens. Uh, you know, right now, the council is conducting hearings, whether or not to certify the EIR, to apply uh, particular land uses. So, um, you know, I, I know it's been stated that the plan uh, does not govern, control, or override local land use regulations, but inserting a number that practically mirrors the developer's housing numbers in their project, uh, the plan gives that presumed perception that you're endorsing it. And, um, you know, that, that really puts us at, at a disadvantage when we get through the process and then we start to negotiate with the developer. You know, just imagine if you were in those shoes yourself and some outside entity uh, put forth some numbers that mirrored the applicant, and it would put you in a tough spot. Uh, you know, currently the city of Brisbane uh, is putting forth a precise plan for 228 units in um, uh, part of our PDA. And I know that uh, Supervisor Pine had made a, a recommendation of taking those Numbers, uh, I would prefer that the number be taken out and the 228 put in its place. However, you know, if, if that's what it is and you, you cannot change those numbers based upon all the analysis that you have done and it would delay the project or delay the plan uh, by, I don't know, whatever, how much.
much time. Um, I would like to have an asterisk on there with a footnote stating what the supervisor had said regarding that the site currently is prohibited from housing um, and that uh, the developer is putting forth those amount of units. Um, and then uh, I know I'm almost done. Okay, so the last thing, uh, President Harris, is I appreciate you taking my call today. And, and you know, we talked about having that letter from ABAG and, and uh, Ms. Gibbons, thank you for um, mentioning that as well. I think that's really important to have that in place. Um, I, I hope that we could also have a similar letter from MTC. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, several of the speakers from Brisbane just changed their comments from 4C to 4B, so we have a few more. Um, John Zwicky and then Denise Louie, followed by Scott Lane, and three more after that. Uh, good evening. I'm John Zwicky, Planning Director in Brisbane. I just have two points I want to make. One is to clarify some of the remarks by uh, Mr. Kirky about the PDA, the Bi-County PDA. Uh, he indicated that the top end of the range in terms of the number of residential units of being 4,400. He neglected to indicate the bottom of the range was zero. Uh, there was no commitment on the part of the city of Brisbane to uh, include housing in the Bayland site. It's currently uh, not zoned for housing, not permitted housing in our general plan. And we indicated the city was going through a process of uh, considering housing, but there's no commitment on the part of the city to approve housing. And that was one of the reasons, in fact, why I was attached to the San Francisco PDA, which did have housing. And on a bi-county basis, irrespective of Brisbane's decision, it would comply with the requirements for housing and jobs and transit and being connected. And then the other question I had relates to, we're fo we fully understand this particular iteration of Plan Bay Area doesn't drive RENA numbers for upcoming cycles. But as I understand, there is a relationship between compatibility between SCS and RENA in the future. So whatever plan is adopted in 2021, I understand the RENA numbers for 2022 would have to be consistent with those. Uh, so I want some clarification. Again, the hypothetical, hypothetical if um, these 4,400 units carry forward, uh, Brisbane does something different with its planning program, what would be the implications for a future RENA? So thank you for your comments. Thank you. I'll let you answer some of these questions at the end, um, Ken. So the next speaker is Denise Louie, followed by Scott Lane, followed by Lori Boo. Good evening. Um, thank everyone here uh, for your active participation in the Plan Bay Area 2040. Uh, you can call me an environmentalist. I advocate for indigenous plants and wildlife that co-evolved with them. And I don't understand why, um, you know, this uh, EIR doesn't address the fact that we have already uh, ruined so much of the environment. Uh, for example, throughout the state, we have lost 99.9% .9 of our native grasslands. And when you look at a piece of land that's undeveloped, you probably think of, oh, potential for housing. Yeah. Well, I look at it as potential habitat for native plants. And what is a native plant? It's indigenous. It was here before Europeans arrived. And, okay, I'm willing, I'm willing to compromise, okay? If you have some, some development, let's give some habitat back also to, to native plants. And when you talk about San Bruno, I love San Bruno Mountain. Why? Because it's undeveloped. And there are so many native species and, uh, of plants and wildlife that co-evolved with them. So it's not just about plants, it's about um, butterflies too. There are rare and endangered butterflies in, in the Bay Area. Uh, the nine Bay Area counties have hundreds if not thousands of species of plants and wildlife that are, that we are standing to the brink of extinction with what we already are doing. So when you say, more growth, where is the, the impact on the environment in this? I understand you want housing because there are more people and, 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 and an unequal balance of, of jobs and people uh, um, and housing, uh, but 
It's the environment that sustains us that we have to pay attention to. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Lane, to be followed by Lori Liu, to be followed by um, Clark Conway. Hello, thank you very much. Hi, Scott Lane. Um, just to put things into perspective a little bit, I think what um, Brisbane and East Palo Alto face is the fact that in large measure, they've not been able to participate in an explosive job growth. So this is an opportunity. But what hasn't been mentioned is 4,400 housing units. 2010 census was 4,282 people, I believe. So think about doubling the size, not just that, 4,400 housing units equates to about 9,900 people. So think about more than doubling your population. I just want to put that in perspective so you can see why they're concerned. They're also saying we put up to 7 million square feet of commercial space to have a Google or an Apple or somebody come in there. You're talking about having an amazing renaissance in Brisbane. But I think the point is, as much as that sounds alarming, I want to say to the folks in Brisbane, this is part of a larger process. And I think folks like myself and others have faith in the EIR and we want to say there are ways that we can make this together. But I do want to put some interesting asterisks to this, however. High Speed Rail should have bought property and rights to be there underneath and then put all of this development on top. Now they're going to have to do that. So talk about putting the cart before the horse. Um, but this also equates to a lot of things around the uh, Bay Area. We basically have been down zoned for the last few decades. We've been building houses, I mean, sorry, commercial at an alarming pace because, of course, that's where the money is. Since we've had these issues, I keep saying we need to go back and say, go with the EIR, but also use this as a prescription to, to change things in California at the Sacramento and Federal, we need to change the commercial property loophole so we can start getting more funding. But also, this isn't, there's a lot of moving pieces of this. Keep it going, work with us together. We want to do it, but also don't build things like a 200 to $300 million interchange over Highway 101. You've got the Bay, Bay Short Intermodal Transit Center, let's work, but let's come up with something together and have faith with the folks that they've done a great job here at NPC and Bay, and I think together we can all make this happen and make Brisbane exciting, but do understand, 4,400 to 9,900 more people, that's why Brisbane is alarmed. And they thank, should, thank, thank you, Scott. You. Lori Lou, followed by Clark Conway, followed by Madison Davis, and that is the last speaker card I will have. Thank you. Mr. McKenzie, Ms. Pierce, honorable members of the NPC and ABAC. My name is Lori Liu, I'm the mayor of Brisbane. And on behalf of our city, I'm voicing our objection to Plan Bay Area, the draft 2040, concerning housing and job growth projections. As you know, we've submitted numerous comments. We've spoken on the phone and in person to many of you, and we continue to strenuously object unless there's been a number of provisions that have been made. And I just want to respond first to um, the point that Chair Pierce made earlier about how this was created in response to what the market would build. Well, the market doesn't dictate what can be built in local jurisdictions. The market doesn't recognize that housing is not permitted under our city's general plan. The market doesn't recognize that the site is contaminated and would have to overcome a number of issues before it can be safe for housing. So that I don't believe is the right metric to be using. And the PDA that's been mentioned, it includes not only the Baylands, but also an area called Parkside, which we are right now going through a precise plan for. And the city is, is currently reviewing um, a proposal for that, and we've, uh, a, we've approved of, we proposed 20, approximately 230 residential units in the Parkside area, which is part of the PDA. And we are considering the Baylands. We have a meeting on August 7th, where we'll, we will be looking at land use. And by putting that 4,400 units, that number in this plan, that presupposes our decision. That takes away control from us locally. And that um, puts a lot of pressure on us from, from the developer community. And I want to also address, you know, there's this misconception, I think, that Brisbane is anti-housing. We are not anti-housing. We feel that, you know, we agree that every city in our Bay Area community has an obligation to do our part um, to address the housing crisis, but we need to do it in a way that's right for our communities. And by putting 
this 4,400 number in here is just presupposing that decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Clark Conway, Madison Davis, and I just got a new car for Jamara Cisneros. Thank you, Madam Chair. Clark Conway, Mayor Pro Tem, Brisbane. My father was a founding father in Brisbane, and I'm currently the longest serving member in the history of Brisbane on our council. Uh, Brisbane has grown over 50% in the last 20 years. There's not very many communities in California that can state that. Now we're being asked to grow 256%. There is nobody in this nine Bay Area County or in the state of California that's being asked to do that. This is ludicrous, pure ludicrous. You need to remove it. You need to stop listening to this executive uh, planning director and do the right thing. Don't vote for this. Don't approve the EIR, okay? Our city council is going to make a decision by the end of August. The best thing you can do right now is table it. Then you'll get something accurate, okay? And that's what I'm asking. Table this till September. Otherwise, this guy, this staff, this council is pulling you into the legal arena. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conway, Madison Davis, and then Jamara Cisneros. Dear Mr. McKenzie, Ms. Pierce, and honorable members of MTC and ABAC, my name is Madison Davis, and I am a councilwoman for the city of Brisbane. I am here before you asking you to amend Brisbane's allotment of 4,400 units in Plan Bay Area 2040 in exchange for an amount that is proportionate to the size of our city. I've heard it said that this version of Plan Bay Area won't have any real impact on the city of Brisbane because it doesn't affect our arena allocation. It does matter. First of all, I understand that consistency with adopted Plan Bay Area will be a major consideration in how MTC allocates discretionary transportation funds under their control. So on the one hand, we're told that Plan Bay Area does not dictate local land use, yet on the other hand, it appears that the city could be financially punished for exercising our local land use control in a manner that displeases MTC. Secondly, Plan Bay Area will be updated again, and the next update will determine arena numbers for the housing element cycle. We have been told repeatedly that Plan Bay Area is a ground-up process based on the general plans of local jurisdictions, except in the case of Brisbane. We represent a special case where MTC and ABAC have substituted their own land use judgment and vision for what is the, be in the best interest of the city of Brisbane. This approach disregards the city's general plan, nullifies the painstaking and thorough process the city is going through, and ignores the city's continued request to be treated fairly. I have been told it is too late to make any changes and am frustrated that other cities have had theirs adjusted. When we have objected to this number in May 2016, September 2016, October 2016, and June 2017, we have not waited until the last minute to object, but rather you have waited until the last minute to act. As MTC elevates its judgment regarding land use over the will of the elected officials and citizens of Brisbane in 2017, why should we expect to be treated any differently in 2021 when the next version of Plan Bay Area is prepared? Will it suddenly be more respectful or deferential to our local land use and decisions? Please think about that. Thank you, Madison. Jamara Cisneros. Um, I'm Steve and I'm here on behalf of UPC uh, Universal Paragon, the property owner of the Bayland site and project applicant of the Brisbane Baylands plan. And I think it's also important to note that I am a board member of the San Mateo County Housing and Leadership Council and the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition. We think ABAC MTC should honor the decision that they made and maintain a forecast of the new 4,400 homes in Brisbane. As a bi county PDA and one of the last undeveloped sites in the region, not including these projected homes in the Plain Bay area during this severe housing crisis <coughs> and major housing jobs imbalance would be inconsistent with SCS, SB 375, and the mission of Plain Bay area to accommodate growth of the regional population in a sustainable manner where we are aiming to lower greenhouse gas per capita and encourage communities to live and work near transit, existing transit, and unique opportunity sites like the Baylands. 
We understand land, land decisions are local, and we will continue to respect the city's process as they come to their decision this summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last speaker card that I have. Is there anything that staff wishes to add before we bring it back up here for action? I, uh, just following up on a couple of the comments. Uh, the environmental issues that were raised, this is a focused growth pattern. All the growth is encompassed within the existing urban limit lines or urban growth boundaries. So Plan Barry is actually a much more environmental approach to growth than the pattern of this region for the last number of decades. Um, in terms of the relationship between the Regional Transportation Plan, SCS, and RENA, it is as was stated. Uh, this cycle has no direct impact. The next cycle for RENA will be arrived at through the number from the state, the Housing Methodology Committee at ABAG, and there will need to be some concurrence with the plan, the next plan to be adopted in 2021. Um, and lastly, I would just mention that this issue was brought before the board and the commission when the draft preferred scenario was presented and presented as the option to go through the EIR process. And the specific issue of Brisbane was discussed at that meeting in this room. So this is not a new issue in that sense. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I have a question over here, and I don't know if you can see my card, Julie. No, I can't. I recognize the voice. OK, um, question for staff. We've had this discussion about whether or not the removal, of course, of a PDA would affect their funding for OBAD grants, other transportation monies. But if they just choose not to go forward with the 4,400 units, but keep the PDA intact, would they see any penalty I don't want to say penalty, but less inclination to be awarded some sort of a transportation grant because of that. The, the PDA criteria is, is, is it's a nomination that comes from the local government. It's something that's adopted by ABEC. Right. Um, so if, if the jurisdiction chose not to remove their PDA designation or request a removal of the PDA designation, it would require an action of ABAC uh, to remove that designation. There's, there's nothing in and of itself that the number in any way uh, has a direct impact in terms of the baseline criteria for PDAs. Uh, right. What area grant, for example. So, so I'm just trying to make, make clear, and again, I'm, I'm a little frustrated by the process. I understand where we are now and that 4,400 units to find someplace else to put them for the purpose of this exercise would be very challenging. I'm prepared to move forward, but I just wanted to have clarified, it's my understanding that because the PDA would remain intact, regardless of whether or not they decided to move forward with the 4,400 units, they would not see some penalty extracted because of that fact in and of itself, only if they withdrew the PDA, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I'm sorry, John. Thank you. A um, couple of comments and a clarification that I think make, need to make for the record. One, I think it's important to reiterate something Ken said earlier, which is that uh, a 700 acre site anywhere in this region that had access by, by uh, highway access and transit access would likely show up as a place for, for, for a major development and for major housing. Um, and, and, I, and I think regardless of city boundaries, what we're talking about is a regional plan here, and I think it's important to keep, to keep that in mind. Um, and I would also point out that, for example, in San Francisco, and I'm sure in many other cities, many areas within our PDAs are not zoned uh, for the housing allocation that we have for those areas today. So that it's not uncommon for a PDA to be identified in advance of the zoning that would accommodate development in those areas. Um, secondly, I just want to make a clarification for the record um, regarding the letter that we received from Council Member Lentz from from um, Brisbane. Um, on the bottom of the first page of that letter, it refers to a statement by Mayor Lee of San Francisco, um, which I just wanted to correct for the record. Um, Councilmember Lentz um, suggested that the mayor uh, suggested that the site in Baylands didn't, should not have been housing. In fact, the letter that the mayor sent had no reference to housing, um, specifically in reference to the EIR with respect to the ecology site. Um, and referred to other letters submitted by city agencies, which in fact did encourage housing on this site. So I just for the record wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other comments or, yes, Trish? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I wanted to get clarification. There was the suggestion of uh, having a footnote that that number, the 4,400 reflects a proposed specific plan. And from listening to earlier comments, I thought it did not come from the, their specific plan, or it did it in fact come from the, this uh, proposed plan from the developer. It came from the range and one of the alternatives that is being reviewed by the city as, as a project under consideration, as has occurred with a number of PDAs, as board member um, right from San Francisco just described, the plan is a long range plan, particularly for the priority development areas. There is assumptions of changes in growth over time that will be accommodated to accommodate the growth in the region. So I appreciate that, but in regards to the specific number, you looked at proposed plans for the specific site, and this 4,400 number came from that. It's not something that you look at separately and just that you decide this is a good place for housing or a possible place. You look at specific proposed plans for all, all of the city proposals. It's an iterative thing. I mean, it, it's, it's in part because this is a major site. Um, it's a priority development area. It is an area of several hundred acres that could accommodate jobs and housing conceptually in the long range. 4,400 was one of the numbers that is in the range being considered by the city. It's not a magic number. Uh, for a, a site this large, the number could be much larger. There's a large employment number being contemplated by the city that's so not being discussed. So I appreciate that. This 4,400 number, though, is it coming from a developer's proposal, specifically from a developer's proposal, as opposed to, it sounds like it's opposed from the city, that you actually looked at proposals from developers and used that number in this proposal. It is being proposed by a developer, that's my understanding. Okay. But and that's not why it's being submitted or included in the plan. Okay, so that's what I wanted to speak to, because is it, did this number come from the developer's proposal, or is it separate from that? That you, there's a different way that you just happen to come up with this same number. It's that number. It is one of the alternatives. So, okay, so the number came from the developer, the yes. developer's proposal. Okay, then my question back to you then is, what other cities did you take developers' proposed numbers that are not in a city's proposal that you're using in this proposal? I'm not aware of, of any. Um, I mean, there are over nearly 200 priority development areas. Many of them have been up zone. Some of them have um, plans and process that have been utilized before. Some of them have numbers that are much higher than anything being currently contemplated by the city. So I appreciate that. But do you have any where you took a Not number from a developer? Of. So I do have a problem with you taking a number from a developer that is not coming from the city, especially if you have not done that with any other project. I don't think it is, in fact, appropriate for this organization or these organizations to go essentially to developers to come up with these numbers. I think it is imperative that these numbers, in fact, reflect complete independent consideration of what these experts think is appro are appropriate places. I wrote, so I, I, I think you have a serious problem because, in fact, I wanted to clarify, was the last speaker on behalf of the developer, was that one of the capacities? Ken, let me, let me clarify a question. Um, I'm sorry, I had a question first. Was the last speaker from the developer? Yes. 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 Capacity. yes. Right. For so, the public so speaker. Fact, the question I think you're trying to ask is, where did the number come from initially? Did it come from the application for the PDA? Or did it come from the developer for the project? It came from the process associated with this priority development area in Brisbane. It is one of the alternatives being reviewed by the city of Brisbane. It wasn't selected because it's a developer's alternative. It was selected because it's one of the alternatives being considered by the city. As proposed for the self-nominated PDA from the city. Correct. That's what we needed to know. A developer cannot put in a PDA. That has to be nominated by the city. So the city proposed a PDA, and this is part of the range that they proposed. Is that correct? Yes. Thank so you. that contradicts what the city is saying. The, the city just seemed, did, did not say that this number came from them. And earlier when I was asking, you 
you, you said that this number came from the developer. So you have a document from the city that has this number of them projecting 4,400 homes on this site. Again, it's one of the alternatives being considered. So I appreciate that. I'm asking specific questions because I think it's critical that we know where this number came from. Do you have, you seem to be suggesting now that in fact you have a document from the city that has 4,400 homes as a, as a possibility on the site, as opposed to from the developer. There are documents from the city, that's part of the process the city is going the, through, that look at this alternative as one of the alternatives to be considered. As part of their PDA process? As part of the planning process for this area, okay. at the city level. That is what is before them, that is what is generating a lot of energy in that community. As if they're suggesting a number, not a developer. Are you taking the developer's number? Trish, I think the point is that, as Ken pointed out in his presentation initially, it, it's an unfortunate coincidence that the number is identical to what the pro developer is proposing, but this actually came from the PDA proposal as one of the alternatives. Because it's part of what the city is proposing as a PDA alternative. Madam Chair, um, I, I would like to have some discussion about um, Supervisor Pine's suggestion about putting some sort of a clarification that the property currently is not zoned for housing. Um, but we and, could say that about any number of well, I, I think that. that's the problem. We've already got an opinion from staff that we cannot add an asterisk right, but to I, any number. But I think in order to move forward, um, I, I think a lot of lessons has been learned through this uh, experience here, but um, if there's something that we can do, maybe we can uh, take uh, a motion now, maybe uh, do it a letter, something that will give a little bit more comfort um, to Brisbane. I have already committed to writing a letter to include those <laughs> points that they need that makes it crystal clear that there is no mandate for this number under any way, shape, or form. It is not a RENA number. And it is in no way, shape, or form an endorsement of any project now or in the future. It's still local control. It is their decision what goes on this property or does not go on this property. And so I think uh, Liz has suggested that that letter be sent to all of the cities. Um, and so I don't know that it applies to all of the cities. I think we, we've got some comments from folks. If we need to do them, for specific instances, I think we will, but we will customize them for each, each jurisdiction. Upon their, request. upon their request. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary for, for all cities. I mean, my city doesn't need anything. You know, there, there's a lot of cities that don't have a problem with, with what this says. So I, I think that's that's a matter of individual. And we, we've heard from some cities that have issues, and, and we can address those through a individualized letter, correct? We can, it may also be useful to include language in the plan that says Plan Bureau 2040 is not a specific endorsement of any development proposal. So we'll put a caveat up in the front. A disclaimer. Very good. All right, I'm getting a nod of the head from the attorney, so that's a good thing. So then do we need to make a motion to that effect, Ken, um, so that the document can be changed? When you get to the plan, and you can amend okay. approval to okay, include that good. language. Sounds good. Okay. We are still on the EIR. If there are... Yeah. Wait. I just want to make sure that that's also on the EIR because the EIR is an official document and I don't want any people um, interpreting as a planning document. Um, so, and using that in, in any legal form as a planning document to hold any city responsible for any of those numbers on the EIR. So is that a motion? Yes, that's my motion. Our, our CEQA attorney, who speaks much more fluent CEQA than I do, uh, has a comment. <laughs> I think that the one thing I just want to make clear is that it's very clear in the statute. We don't have to asterisk anything or footnote anything. The statute is super clear that there does not, that, that, that this is not in any way usurping local control. So all people have to do is look at the statute. It is crystal clear. Well, that's not, that's not the question. The question is, 
that what the problem is is that uh, we don't want developers coming and bringing their lawyers and say this is an official document that has that number because this happened to my city. This is an official number, and we're planning on that basis. And you know, you guys approve that. It's an approved, it's an approved document. It's an approved document, but it's an aspirational document. It's a document that um, is used for showing whether or not you can achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions. Okay. And the statute makes it very clear that any general plan need not be consistent with the SCS and vice versa. Okay, so then I don't think there's a problem with putting a disclaimer in the IR. And I'll second your motion for purpose of You just answered my question. That's just, there's not a problem putting a disclaimer on the IR. It's not going to bind anybody to anything. It's just reiterating yeah, I just, the facts. What, I guess what I'm saying is that it's clear in the statute it need not be done. Okay, we, we understand it need not be done, but if it'll make people feel comfortable with it and be willing to act on these items, I think that's a good thing. Um, I do have a Madam second um, where that voice came from. Yeah. This, yes, Karen. Can I just suggest that the disclaimer be the language that's the statute? That there makes it very clear <laughs> there you go. that we're planning on this based on what the statute says, just what our CEQA attorney said, put it right up front. It's clear, it's in the statute, we don't have to wordsmith it, and you know, any developer that would come to my county or when I sat on a city council that says, here it is, I've got staff that would say, no, it's not. And we all have those staff. So just put the language in the front of the thing and maybe we can move on. Okay. Um, I do have a second request from one of our speakers. Mr. Conway, you have two minutes max, and then I am closing public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Quickly, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, the state of California is batting Brisbane around like a pinata right now. Okay, I'll guarantee you every one of your representatives up in Sacramento know who Brisbane is. And we're being lobbied against. We're being picked on. Okay? Now, the state of California wouldn't change the rules, would they? You guys remember RDA? Redevelopment? How many of your cities were in redevelopment? There's like 400 something cities in, in the, uh, the state of California that were RDA members. You got the rug pulled out from under you. So it was the state of California that created glut or created the problem with affordable housing because they took away that 20% from the uh, redevelopment agencies. So do you think the state of California would change the rules here and say, oh, Hey, you're a PDA. We look, you know, that's the plan. Think about it, okay? I'm asking you, don't vote on this. Table it, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am going to ask for a motion to approve from the ABAG board to approve the EIR with the language to add the statute to the front of the documents. So Sorry, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Steve. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I could just uh, bring up a procedural point. The commission has already approved the EIR without that language. Uh, I believe that that language belongs in the plan and the plan alone. The plan is where you state policy. The EIR is where you analyze the policies that you're considering. Uh, so my preference would be for you to adopt it as MTC has already adopted it and to consider that provision in the plan adoption okay. subsequently. Understood? I'll amend my motion to just approve the EIR. Thank you. Motion by Karen. Second by Glover. You're not on the APEC, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a, second by, a, second, a second by rabbit. Sorry, I have to exceed to my vice president. <laughs> I'd like to make a point. I'm sorry. Comment from where? I'm sorry. Wayne, did you have further discussion? Okay. Go ahead. So we're approving the EIR, and EIRs, I, mean, I, I tried to go through it, 
maybe I missed that page or something. But, but um, it, it, just clarify, all of the comments that have been made by the city of Brisbane would be included in this document, right? In the, the final EIR? They have. They are. They're in there, right? <laughs> all the comments on yeah. the EIR are included in the EIR as is the response to comments. So for that part of it, and I, I, mean, I have a lot to say about this discussion that I won't say now, but I, and I truly have thank you, Barbara. Sympathy for, but I think it, it, I just think that's somewhat consoling that all of these objections from the city of Brisbane are in what we're proving right now. All right. With that, I am going to. Um, Can I just clarify, Ken? Did Brisbane comment on the plan or the EIR or both? Brisbane only commented on the plan. That's what my point is. And so that Brisbane's objections is not going to be in the EIR document. It's only going to be in the plan. Okay. That's been clarified. All right. All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Opposed. Okay. Lee opposed. Anyone else? Spencer opposed. Anyone else? Canapa. Canapa opposed. Pine opposed. Anyone else opposed? Anyone abstaining? Okay. That passes with the vote as recorded by the clerk with four opposed. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Now we go on. Now we go on to the plan. We move on to MDC's consideration of the plan. Um, MTC resolution number 4300 to be followed by ABAG resolution number 1012, the final plan Bay Area in 2040 to adopt the final plan Bay Area, the 2040 regional transportation plan, including the region's 2017 SCS, sustainable community strategy, and the regional growth forecast. Ken, do you have more to report at this point? The only thing I would add, uh, Commissioner Halston, is that if one wants to refer to page 22 of the final plan, there are, I believe, three paragraphs specifically calling out local control and what the plan is and what it is not. Thank you very much. Um, then, um, Julie, would you like to... Sure, let's go to public comment for for both of us. Um, Madam Chair, just before we start, because of the problem with the EIR, can we agree that MTC is going to consider a plan with that language in there that is the legislation so that it's right in the plan and so, we don't have to worry about it? So when the motion comes up, the motion would include that, I guess, I just unless there's an objection. Thank you. I'm not a member of MTC, but so I, I make, to make sure you that motion now. No. When it, after public comment and commission Thank comment, you. we will make that motion. Can Can I ask a question? Can 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 ABAC take the uh, vote first before we do the MC, MTC vote? So we don't have that same issue while we're well, we, know we, sure, we don't. Well, we have a no, comment no, no. from from, from, from Vice Chair Halston to include that in the motion when MTC is moved. So well, we kind of we, we feel that I feel that it needs more clarification than just the statute. I mean, it's crystal clear that this is just a plan and not obligating cities. Even though the statute says though it can be interpreted as many I mean, it's crystal clear to some people, but other. But I'm not an attorney, but I can I know there are clever attorneys out there, and I need to have reassurance that there's a disclaimer that says that this is just doesn't obligate any cities to this number. So that would apply to both MTC and ABAG, so is there yes. any reason not to continue? So that's process? why I'm asking the ABAG to discuss this first and vote first. Well, we're, we're going to take public comment first, and our first speaker is... Oh, David Pilpel. Pilpel? Pilpel. I, I'm not sure where the accent goes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, David Pilpel from San Francisco. Um, some, uh, a, a number of comments. Um, I, 
been involved with MTC and transportation planning for a long time, but I've not been to any of your meetings in a long time, and I guess I picked the, the helpful one to, to um, I also applied to serve on MTC's policy advisory council, and that, that application is pending, so uh, I'm available if anyone wants to, to talk further. I guess I could come to more meetings. Um, I think that this plan does better align transportation investments with equity um, housing and other goals, and it is good in that regard. Um, I think that the uh, outreach that was uh, conducted uh, varied, and I want to point out very specifically that the Marin model of having not just an open house, but having discussion, um, not entirely unlike the discussion you're having tonight uh, about the policy implications uh, and trade-offs uh, in the, the plan, was very helpful, and that really should be the model and the requirement for all outreach uh, in the future um, on future updates uh, to this plan. Um, I want to touch for a second on the action plan, which I think is important to, again, get us closer to uh, the goals. I think that updates on implementation of the action plan are important. Um, they should be regular, and they should be shared with the public. However you choose to do that, that I believe should happen. Uh, I wanted to touch for a second on Connect SF, which is um, a scenario planning exercise that we've been engaged in in, in San Francisco. Uh, Director Ram and others could uh, talk about that. Uh, staff from ABAG and MTC have been involved, and it's a, a different way of looking at how we plan, uh, and I think there are some uh, lessons that may be applicable uh, to planned area and other uh, exercises. Um, I'm wearing a uni t-shirt tonight. I'd be happy to wear uh, a new t-shirt from the Merge uh, Agencies. Um, I would suggest using a uh, slogan that you had many years ago that said, be regionable. So if you want to make those uh, t-shirts, be happy to, to wear one and provide that. Um, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much. We um, appreciate it. Again, that. the plan is better than previous plans. There's more work that we can all do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. All right. Um, we have quite a few comments. I'm going to ask you please to stay on the two minutes. I have a feeling we've heard from you before. So Cliff Lentz, and then Madison Davis, then Clark Conway, then Scott Lane. Thank you, Madam President. So I'm not going to go over the stuff that I did uh, earlier when I spoke, but I do want to address the, the housing unit number and how that was uh, put together. Uh, yes, the executive director said that the city submitted uh, these various plans. That's all public record. You know, the, the specific plan from the developer is one of the plans. That happened to be the plan that, that, that uh, was chosen. And in that specific plan, there's 4,434 units. Right, so that was the number that was chosen because that was in that plan. That came directly from the developer. It did not come from the city of Brisbane. And so I really want to make that clear to all of you. When you make that final vote and you think about, okay, is it appropriate for and, uh, you know, governing bodies like yourselves to apply a number that has come from a developer rather than something that your city, working with your colleagues on the council, working with your citizens, have come up with an appropriate amount for a particular site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. The next speaker is Madison Davis to be followed by Clark Conway. Hello, everyone. I'll be really brief. Because I couldn't fit it in my two minutes before, I really want to thank everyone who answered my calls and who called me back. I really appreciate you taking the time on such short notice to talk with me. And thank you for everyone who's advocated on our behalf tonight. I really appreciate it. I do want to reiterate a little bit about what Cliff said. Um, pulling a number directly from a developer's proposal is setting precedent tonight. So this can happen to you. And if you're going to fight that, it will be a lot more difficult if it's already been set as a precedent. So I think that's something that you need to think about because this may you may be in this position later on down the line. I also really want to reiterate the fact that the site is quite toxic. Um, it's the site of a, a current tank farm. It was the site of a former, former chemical company. Um, it was an unregulated dump, and it was also a former rail yard. So 
it's not like we're just objecting to housing just because. I mean, there, there's a reason to this. Um, you have to take into consideration so many different factors when you uh, plan your community, and one of them really has to be the health and safety of people. And, and what are you willing to subject people to? What are you willing to take responsibility for 20 years down the line? So this is a really big issue, and it's really hard to explain in two minutes, but what you really need to know is that um, there, it's, human, it's a human health issue that we're really thinking about here. Thank you. Thank you, Madison. Uh, Clark Conway, followed by Scott Lane. Thank you, Madam Mayor, or Madam Speaker. Uh, so I just want to uh, ditto my comments from the EIR, and also, you know, use a number 256%. Okay, 256%. That's so unfair. Think about what's going on in Sacramento. Like I said, we're being batted around. This is just so unfair. These numbers are not coming from us. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes and you, Mr. San Francisco, back there and all around. You know exactly what's going on. And you guys need to wake up because it happens to your city. The wine. Thank you, Clark. Scott Lane, followed by David Zisser, followed by Jack Levin. Hello, good evening again. Once again, I want to thank uh, MTCA Bank for all of this. Um, but do want to note that uh, I'm no lawyer. However, any and all conversations, documents that are recorded here are part of the public record, and that is part of what the developers and everyone else is going to look at. When I was at a wonderful uh, Plan Barry meeting in the North Bay, there were some cities in the North Bay that were complaining vociferously about how many units, hundreds of units, were being added between now and 2040. Maybe you should look at the list of all the different cities that have a tiny fraction. How many cities? We may have 10, 20 cities, 30 cities that combined will reach 4,400. I fully embrace this document. You can put housing in all sorts of places. I remember when I asked Steve, how many units are we short even before the boom? I think the answer was 200,000. So let's say we have 300,000 housing units to add. We probably do, but we need solutions. But to put the burden on one city, while many cities are complaining about a tiny fraction of this, I'm sorry, I'm speaking for myself, not as an MTC Policy Advisory Commission member, I think this is utter insanity. I am tired of the Lawyer Full Employment Act. I don't want this to go to a lawsuit. Please make sure it's a PDA. Take the number out. Leave it up to them. Let them have control. This is like telling a homeowner to tell them how to develop their property. Where I have been for years saying MTC and ABAG need to have more jurisdictional authority and power. You've got Regional Measure 3 coming up. If this, this is, I'm sorry, this is an abuse of power. There's no other way to say it. Every city needs to be the master of their domain. And I don't care what the asher says. My dad always said, the big print give it, the small print take it away, and no one pays attention to the small print. For the love of God, all you folks in the cities, we can bury 4,400 housing units somewhere. Let's find it and let's let them control their destiny. Please, thank you. Thank you, Scott. David Zisser, then Jeff Levin, then Stevie Dawson. I'm going to change the subject. Um, <laughs> Thank you, David. Cool. Um, my name is David Zisser. I'm uh, here on behalf of Public Advocates and the Six Winds Network, and I'm speaking in support of adoption of the Planter Area. For nearly three years, uh, we have worked with you all at MTC and ABAG, uh, I'm sorry, with you all and MTC and ABAG staff to develop a planned area that moves us towards a more equitable region by focusing on affordable housing displacement and transit investments that serve low-income renters. I don't see my clock ticking, just so um, I don't want to talk forever. While we all know that the plan isn't perfect, uh, your direction to include an action plan that, that focuses on the performance goals that are moving in the wrong direction, particularly housing affordability and displacement, provide an opportunity for NTC and ABAG to provide meaningful leadership and guidance to tackle the housing affordability crisis. And the crisis is real. <laughs> And the actions outlined in the action plan are critical to stemming displacement and creating more affordable housing opportunities. According to the plan, an additional 107,000 low-income households will be at risk of displacement by 2040, bringing the total to 267,000 households. That's about 600,000 people at risk of displacement. People of color, women, children, and people with disabilities are hit hardest by the crisis. 
That's why I'm so supportive of the proposed revisions to the action plan, which the joint committee unanimously approved a couple weeks ago. They provide the specificity and the clarity that MTC, ABAG, local jurisdictions, advocates, and community members need and deserve. The revised action plan provides tangible direction on local, regional, and statewide solutions that CASA, MTC, and ABAG can further refine and work towards implementing. I want to thank staff, the CIFR city, for incorporating the input they received from the public to develop a more meaningful action plan. They listened, and they worked hard to get to a place of consensus. And I want to thank you all for your ongoing leadership and commitment to ensuring that all Bay Area residents benefit from our region's prosperity and growth. While the work's not done yet, you'll, make, you'll help make important headway by approving the action plan and the area today. Thanks. Thank you, David. The next speaker is Jeff Levin, followed by Stevie Dawson, followed by Pedro Galvao. Good evening, I'm Jeff Levin. I'm the policy director with East Bay Housing Organizations. We are also a member of the Six Winds Coalition, and I've been an active participant in the regional advisory working group from the outset of this process. Um, and we are tonight speaking in support of adoption of this plan. Um, first, we would really like to um, echo David's thanks to uh, staff for all of their hard work and for meeting and working with us um, throughout the process listening to us, taking seriously our concerns and our suggestions and incorporating many of those in the final document. And we really appreciate all the work that has, has gone into that. Um, at the outset of this process, you adopted a set of performance <coughs> measures that would be used to assess the performance of the various scenarios. Um, and while the, uh, the final scenario um, and this plan performs pretty well on most of those performance measures, it's clear that it falls far short on some of them, and in particular, housing affordability and increased risk of displacement, which are, at the moment, the region's most pressing um, concerns throughout the region. Um, so to address these issues, the plan includes an action plan, which we um, very much supported. And we appreciate and support the most recent revisions, uh, which provide a lot more specificity, specificity about actions that ABAG and MTC can take both as regional leaders and to support action at both the state and the local level. Um, so we look forward to working with you on actually implementing this plan. We will also be um, greatly involved in the CASA process as we try and shape regional solutions to regional problems. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, next speaker is uh, Stevie Dawson, followed by Pedro Garval, followed by Lori Liu, and our final speaker is Matt Vetterslice. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Stevie Dawson. I am with the East Bay Housing Organizations and Six Wings. I live in affordable housing in West Oakland. This is it. This is what we've worked for for two years. We've been working toward a planned Bay Area that will bring more equitable, affordable housing, displacement, and transit solutions. The action plan has clear, specific language that provides direction. Affordable housing and displacement needs have been addressed to a greater degree than I would have anticipated, and that is because the staff has listened to the public comment and incorporated it into the action plan, and we thank you very much for that. We're grateful for all the work the staff has done, and I urge you to vote for this plan tonight. Make it possible for all Bay Area residents to thrive. I've been among the voices that have advocated for the vulnerable, and among those are people of color, women, children, the disabled, seniors, low-wage earning workers. All of these people are the first to feel the pain of a crisis, any crisis an economic crisis, a housing crisis, or the crisis of simply being overlooked and ignored. Your leadership tonight will ensure that all Bay Area residents are part of our future growth and opportunity. Every one of us who live here and work here want to continue to be fortunate enough to live here and work here. So we rely on your guidance. Please vote yes on this tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stevie. Next speaker is Pedro Galvao, followed by Lori Lou. And again, the last card I have is Matt Vanderslice. Good evening, ABAG board members and MTC commissioners. My name is Pedro Galvao, and I'm with the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Um, first, I want to begin by thanking everyone in this room, especially staff, for their hard work in getting us to this point. 
Um, the plan has come a long way, and I am here to offer our enthusiastic support of the plan as proposed by staff and its action plan. Um, as I want to echo the previous speakers, uh, staff has really put together a public process that heard from the community and took our input seriously. And they put together an action plan that I think we can all be proud of. Um, plan the area, the preferred scenarios, for, without any mitigating actions, it's projected low, lower income families are projected to be spending two, over two thirds of their income in housing and transportation costs and an additional 107,000 households would be at risk of displacement if the plan were to go forward without mitigating actions. This action plan helps right the course and helps move the region in a sustainable and equitable direction. And for that, um, I am really grateful and I look forward to continuing to work with you through this body as well as through the council process on making Plan Bay Area as successful as it could possibly be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro, Lori Liu, and then Matt Vanderslice. Thank you, Lori Liu, Mayor of Brisbane. I want to reiterate the prior comments that I made in opposition to the draft plan. And I also want to second um, my colleague Clark Conway's suggestion that you delay the vote on this issue until September. In Brisbane, we are currently in the process of deliberating. We have worked really hard on the EIR on the Baylands. Uh, we've held meetings monthly and bi-monthly since last December, and we are now on the cusp of making a land use decision. Uh, we have meetings slated through the end of August, so it would be, um, we, we respectfully ask if you delay the vote, you know, there would be no harm in doing so, and it would avoid the serious risk if you vote tonight of having your actions misconstrued as unduly influencing the outcome of our independent planning process and adding legal adding fuel to the legal argument um, by the developer to potentially say that you've approved of the housing at the Baylands. So thank you for listening to our concerns. Thank you, Lori. Matt Vanderslice. And that is the last speaker card. Good evening, Matt Vanderslice with Green Belt Alliance. Uh, I'm here before you this evening after the four years that we've worked together to craft this plan. Uh, to encourage you to approve the plan as proposed this evening. Uh, this is a smart, long-range strategy uh, to accommodate our region's expected growth to better serve the 7 million residents uh, of our region in ways that strengthen our economy, improve social equity, uh, address uh, uh, sustainability, and improve the quality of life for all of our communities. But we're excited that the new plan affirms the vision of the original plan there and guiding growth within our existing cities and towns to create walkable communities for all close to jobs and transit uh, and safeguard our iconic natural and agricultural lands. We appreciate that the plan highlights the housing affordability crisis that we are suffering today, noting that the lack of homes that people can afford near job centers is squeezing far too many Bay Area residents and increasing sprawl and development pressure on the edges of the region. Some of the best elements of the plan we have before you tonight are that it accommodates 100% of all expected growth in the region within existing growth boundaries. And it does so by guiding that growth into places near jobs and transit, including brownfield sites, including sites next to our major uh, transit infrastructure for the region. Uh, it includes an action plan with bold regional strategies to address housing affordability and the impacts of climate change. We know that this is the right approach. There's a deep body of research identifying that guiding new homes into infill locations spurs economic growth, reduces monthly household costs, cuts greenhouse gas emissions, saves water, uh, and protects the natural and agricultural uh, heritage that is part of what makes this region so unique. We deeply appreciate the work of staff and all of the commissioners over the last four years to guide us uh, to a place that's fair and balanced, uh, and at a time of such deep national division, I think now is the time to come together as a region around a, a regional vision for how we can grow uh, that shows the rest of the country that the Bay Area can become a more sustainable, equitable, economically prosperous region for everyone. I think that's what the nation needs to see right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to go to staff because I saw some consultation between the attorneys and the executive director, and I want to hear what that uh, 
told us. So, uh, Madam uh, Chair, board members, uh, as Ken indicated, on page 22 of the plan before you, there is a section entitled Local Control, which already summarizes uh, uh, the relevant provisions of state law, but I would propose that you add two sentences verbatim from state law, and I'll read them into the record. This is Government Code 65080B2K. Sentence number one. Nothing in a sustainable community strategy shall be interpreted as superseding the exercise of the land use authority of cities and counties within the region. Sentence number two, nothing in this section shall require a city's or county's land use policies and regulations, including its general plan, to be consistent with the regional transportation plan or an alternative planning strategy. All right, that's uh, section 65080B. with most of us, if not all of us. 
and you certainly did with Alameda. So thank you. Initially, our plan had had proposed housing on our reserve where we have our lease uh, term and housing on top of our uh, already established shopping centers. And those were removed. Of course, the uh, proposed houses on the lease term reserve was removed, and that was a mistake. And so that was acknowledged, and the number was reduced. For some reason, it sounds like Brisbane has not been afforded that same opportunity. And in fact, since they raised this issue, I would have preferred hearing that you did a value and TC, whomever does this analysis, did their independent analysis and came back with a number that didn't, wasn't coincidentally a number from a developer. So I do think that is a serious problem. As much as I think all these other cities can think, yes, we did our job, we met their needs, I think our job as a regional board is in fact to think of all the parts of the region and not to leave any of them behind. So I applaud you for resolving it with all these other cities, but honestly, I, since I didn't hear from you that you did in fact come up with an independent number that you think is the appropriate number for Brisbane, I will not be able to support it. And while I acknowledge the law that you're saying it has no relevance, I can tell you, the developer would not be here tonight speaking if it had no relevance. Absolutely. And so anyone that is thinking that it has no relevance, at the end, I do hope that you will help support Brisbane in underscoring that because obviously there is a problem. When a developer shows up, they are here advocating. Make no mistake. And when that number is not independent, independent, I think there is a problem. So yes, I applaud you for working with the rest, all of us. I think Brisbane has a serious problem. Now, I would, in fact, uh, they did ask, can this wait until September? What is uh, staff's response in regards to having it wait until September, since they are obviously in negotiations currently with the developer? Well, one response is we have a $300 billion transportation plan aligned with this action. And there are projects in that plan that may suffer distress if we are not able to adopt this plan today. We have a cycle that we adopt these plans every four years. And so essentially, the approvals we have run out when the plan runs out. And one project in particular uh, with BART that I'm aware of uh, does have a timing problem if we wait. So I, I think there is a material difference between acting tonight and waiting. So I appreciate that. I will not be able to support a moving forward. I think it's extremely unfortunate that you all did not make some arrangement with Brisbane. I think that uh, most of us know they would not be here if there had been some compromise or some independent analysis that arrived at that number. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Wayne Lee, then Liz Gibbons, and then Dave Mike. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to, I've got, uh, two subjects and I've been talking about this for a long time and um, we, I want to make sure we, we all focus on what we're trying to do with this whole Bay Area plan is provide a quality of life for everybody, a good quality of life for everybody in the Bay Area. So what does that mean? That means less pollution, less travel, places, you know, places to commute, uh, commute. What I see missing from this whole plan, and I've been harping about this the whole time, is that the small cities, even though we want to build these houses because we know that's the right thing to do and the thing we have to do, there's no economic, enough economic discussion about how we're going to sustain these communities that are gonna grow around the small cities. The small cities cannot make much money from property taxes. Property taxes just do not make up enough money for services. So there needs to be more discussions about providing grocery stores and also retail around these communities that we're building that could preferably walking distance, because that's the holy grail, right? Near transportation or, or, or walking distance. That is not in the plan. I've been talking about this forever. 
for like at least a year, and it's still not in the plan. So I, I'm just trying to figure that out. Um, why isn't the economy a big part of this plan? Number two, I also have a problem with opening the door to say, this developer has said, oh, we were able to get our numbers in this plan. What's going to say to other developers to say, oh, they did it. Why can't we do it? We can do that, too. We're going to tell staff what our numbers are, and they're going to say, yeah, that sounds good. Let's put it. I think that's a bad precedence. I, I cannot support this. Thank you, Wayne. Liz, and then Dave. Uh, thank you. And also echoing all of the um, kudos to staff and all of the members past and present who have worked hard to make this um, document happen and its significance in the community. I'm still struggling with support. Um, and I will say that um, I think the Brisbane situation is simply bringing out a potential a problem and precedent setting. Um, I think the language in the report does help it. Um, but I will tell you, the last speakers uh, brought up my concerns again, which is there is an expectation out in the community that this document is real and it will inevitably force communities to build to what this says. Everyone came here and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for making all of this happen. There's a lot of good things in here that people are responding to and I appreciate that. But this document, as we have said, does not guarantee, dictate, or require any of this to be done. And to have the housing communities have too high an expectation of what this will ultimately produce is a worry to me. I, I, um, I, I, am, I am concerned. And um, so I would just offer one of the things that the document talks about is kind of mix and matches um, the words of strategy versus plan. When we use the plan, it has more reality. We've been speaking of it in language, um, and there's some in the text that says it's a strategy. This is a strategy on how to accomplish these things by 2040. And I think strategy is a better word um, um, to clarify what we're really trying to do. It's not a plan. Someone said, I think quite nicely, it's, it's not a compilation of plans um, from other communities all put together. This is what our best thinking and starting point. I was here the night you approved the um, in the audience on the preferred scenario. There was a lot of debate. We have to move forward. You have to move forward, um, for, good, for better or worse. But I think we have to be very thoughtful uh, for the expectation of the housing groups and also the legal challenges that our cities will face. Um, because I believe they will come. Um, I really do. So, uh, and then if there's a, any ability going forward that the OBEG grants can be dis, uh, separated for communities that have had uh, zoning or, or excess growth assumptions, I think it would be fairer to them, um, rather than risk them pulling out of the PD um, scenario. Thank you, Liz. Dave Pine and then Barbara Halliday. So I had a, a question. Well, first off, I, I think the language um, su suggested uh, earlier that you added is, is helpful, but we had some discussion as well about a letter. Is that still intended to be? Yes, it is. And that would go from both MTC and ABAG? I can commit to it going from ABAG. Um, I would assume it could also go from MTC. Would we have any objection as MTC? Uh, Mr. Chairman, given the fact that it's a dual plan, I, I think you'd have to agree on the language, which I hope you're not going to start doing tonight. But, um, <laughs> no, we don't. I have no intention. <laughs> Jim, Jim, Jim and I will work on the letter, and we will both sign it. We will. Yeah. It'll we be, will both sign it'll one be letter. Giant. How about that? Okay. In the spirit of the new. Collaboration. collaboration. There you go. You got it. Okay. Any other? I think that that will be helpful. I, this is, is a difficult issue. I think the process has not worked well with respect to Brisbane, which is been in this position tonight. Um, I voted against the EIR because I, I think the input was flawed. Um, 
I'm going to tell my friends in Brisbane that I am going to vote for the plan because I think uh, the language that's been added in this letter makes it pretty, makes it as clear as you possibly can um, the meaning of these numbers and the overall significance of the plan Bay Area is such that uh, it would be difficult for me to pass it to the Senate. Thank you, David. Barbara? Yes. Um, well, I'd like to agree with a great deal with some of the comments that have been made about the situation in Brisbane. I hope that as we move forward with, you know, a, a merged staff here, that it, this isn't a harbinger of not wanting to work with local governments. And I don't really think that it is, because I do think that you worked very hard most of the local governments and um, you're not hearing a lot of dissent, but it is a very unusual situation and uh, I hope that the record of this meeting will make it clear that this number, I almost feel like in a way we're proving a bit of a lie or something, but I understand how we have to make it work and we're under a time constraint and because of all the good things, um, I won't vote against it, I, I will support it. I just would like to add, and I think Mayor Lee over there for bringing up the whole subject of what isn't in this plan. What isn't in this plan is how cities that are now, you know, given these numbers and, and probably going to develop a lot of this housing. We, we don't disagree that it's needed, but how are we going to provide the services that these new larger communities are going to need because we know the numbers don't pan out for cities. We know the tax situation in this state is not favorable to cities and it keeps getting worse. The state is foisting this on us in a way through SB 375 and yet continues to erode the funds we have to support the services that are going to be needed, especially um, with the numbers we're looking at, we know increased public safety services essential for having a quality community. And I think we need to, as we move forward, we need to consider those issues a lot more than we have in this plan. But otherwise, I, I'll echo the things that it, it, it's a it's a big job and we have to do, do this and there's a lot in here that's good that brings us together and in the spirit of cooperation, I hope we can move it forward together. Thank you, Barbara. Um, seeing no other comments from our board, I have a motion by Eklund, a second by Haggerty to approve a bag resolution number 10-17, final plan bay area with the addition of the uh, uh, former mentioned sections. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay, Lee and Spencer. Spencer. Any others? Just two opposed. All right, that passes then. Thank you very much. And I will turn it over to the chair, or the vice chair of the planning committee. Having done all the work, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I will therefore move to approve MTC resolution number 4300, final plan Bay Area 2040, with the uh, additional language as already stated. Second. Second. Oh, thank you. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Mr. <coughs> Carter. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. I, I know I've heard the question eight or nine times. Ken, I just wanted to understand it clearly. You got this 4,400 number from the city of Brisbane. Is that right? Yes, from the city's process. Okay. It wasn't fed you by from a developer. I've never spoken to a developer. Well. Okay. So. so it came from city documents. Correct. In the city of Brisbane. Correct. That submitted a PDA application, which was granted. They submitted a PDA application several years ago. Right. This process has been going on for several years, and one of the alternatives is a developer alternative. That did not come from the developer. It was not selected because it was a developer's alternative. Okay, I understand. Thank you. I, you know, I, I represent a city that has, among the major cities in the United States, the worst jobs to housing ratio among the 40 largest cities in the country. We're the only major city in the United States that actually has a smaller daytime population than nighttime population. And I am very acutely aware of the concerns people have about the fiscal challenges of bearing the burdens of housing. But we're allocated more than 35,000 units in the arena. Uh, 
allocation in. We're going to do everything we can to go to every one of those units. And we're going to do it because we are collectively facing a crisis in affordable housing. A crisis that is making it impossible for your residents' children to be able to live here in the Bay Area. It is a crisis that is uh, making traffic uh, intolerable for any of your residents because jobs are located in job-rich communities and housing is located elsewhere. Uh, and as long as smaller job-rich towns are not willing to take their responsibility for building housing, we will continue to perpetuate what exactly we have now, and it will be exacerbated. A crisis of affordable housing, traffic will continue to be worse. Uh, I was actually inclined to vote against this plan because I don't think it goes nearly far enough, but not nearly enough teeth to force cities and jurisdictions to bear the responsibility for housing that we are clearly not bearing as uh, I am going to very reluctantly vote for this because there is a CASA process that will be underway. I know uh, already staff is working on it and we'll be convening a board soon. I look forward to doing what we can to step up as a region to do what we need to do to house people in our region. Um, but I, I have to say I'm disappointed by the dialogue I've heard so far because we've got a long way to go to address this crisis and I haven't heard a lot of discussion about the crisis. Thank you. Commissioner Um, Thank you for those words, Mayor Ricardo. I was going to say something very similar, but less eloquent. I, I, think, um, uh, I think we have a real crisis here as a region. We need to address it as a region. I think um, even though staff has taken huge steps, in, especially with regards to the action plan, in putting in place some real commitments for what um, we're going to look at going forward, um, in the next year, in the next two years, in the next three years, not necessarily wait until 2040. I still don't think under the best case scenario envisioned in this plan, we're going to have a region where my 17-month-old kids are going to know that they can go to school and there will be enough teachers um, who can live in the Bay Area, live in San Francisco, to be able to teach them at that school and that if they ever grow up and want to be cops or firefighters or teachers, that they'll be able to find a place to live here on, on their own. And um, but I do think that it is a step in the right direction, and I do really appreciate staff working closely with the advocacy community um, to, to sort of make this plan and the action plan more robust. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to be supporting this as well, and I hope this is kind of the start um, or the sort of continuation of a lot of work, but that the sort of the, through the CASA process and otherwise, we can really start coming up with some of the kind of the bold solutions that. Um, when we do implement them, we will be able to really make a dent in the, the, the affordability crisis that we're facing in our region. Thank you. Are there further comments? I would just like to say that I hope that this step will move us next time closer to a preferred scenario that we really are happy to endorse. I mean, we're happy to endorse this, but it doesn't, you know, as, as Mr. Giuseppe was, we have a long way to go. So I'm very um, happy to move forward, and I then will call for the vote um, for MTC on the same resolution as was passed by AVEC. So all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Sus uh, abstentions? Uh, unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Now, MTC has one further uh, matter to consider, which is the proposed amendment to the 2017 Transportation Improvement Plan, um, revision number 2017-14, MTC resolution number 4275, serves to conform the 2017 TIP to Plan Bay Area 2040 and revise the 61 projects with a net funding increase of approximately $3.8 billion. I move to approve the proposed amendment to the 2017 improvements. Second. Second. <laughs> Is there further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, uh, that uh, finishes this part of the meeting. Back to Chair McKenzie, I believe. And just to the yes. ABAG members, even though you don't have any more action items, there really is only one more item on this, and that is public comment. If you could just sit tight for a second, we have one speaker card that Jake will address. 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your lively discussion. And we look forward to seeing you back here in September. But we'll turn it back over to the chair. Yes, I'd just uh, first of all like to thank uh, the Vice Chair of the Planning Committee for uh, noble duty tonight, and also my uh, colleague and compadre, President Pierce. Um, indeed, uh, a wee bit different evening than uh, we endured four years ago over across the Bay in Oakland, and we can all be thankful for that. Um, anyway, Number five, public comment, I call on Jane Kramer. Oh. oh, there's a whole stack of public comments, sorry. Sorry, I apologize. I didn't realize that there were other ones in here. But anyway, sorry, on you go. Jane Kramer, and I want to comment on item, agenda item 8B from this afternoon's discussion, and I want to play it devil's advocate. Um, the topic was a possible increase in the bridge toll and how it was to be used by whom, and then the issue of equity came up, and it was not very well defined, and you ended up in a conundrum. Um, and then someone said, well, a small percentage of people pay the toll. And to me, that's not relevant to the breaking the conundrum. Um, because, as was previously stated, the present bridges were paid by, for by others in the past. And in many cases, there's no memory of those persons, or those persons have no memory of the bridges being built. They aren't here where they were disinterested in the issue and so they didn't pay attention. However, those who pay the small, the small percentage of people who pay that toll today take those bridges for granted. So that plus the fact that needs and demographics are gonna probably change in the future what really solves the problem is communities learn to think beyond local place only and also think regionally. And that means thinking in terms of options and possibilities down the road of the future, just like the folks that paid for the bridges in the past that we now use. Um, and what that really does is builds obligation. And out of obligation, you build a sense of um, social cohesion and discussion. It can get messy, but people weather through it. Uh, thank you. I do have one other card here from Denise Louie, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'm a member of the California Native Plant Society. We have 35 or 36 chapters, including the one, the latest is uh, in Baja, California, because California is a biodiversity hotspot. And Cal the Native Plant Society has identified over 6,300 species of plants indigenous to California, many of which live only in California, nowhere else in the world. And uh, many of these are, uh, species are also at risk of extinction because, first of all, habitat loss, secondly, uh, invasive plants, and now global climate disruption. So I want to encourage each person here tonight to please support the California Native Plant Society and you know attend their lectures or uh, plant sales and join their hikes and learn what is still out there for us. Uh, we want future generations to be able to enjoy these uh, wild species too. So please, when you go home, make sure that you know we don't lose another square foot of their habitat. Um, and in fact, do what we can to support organizations like the California Native Plant Society at cnps.org. And, uh, and support the uh, habitat restoration, meaning uh, giving habitat back 
to indigenous species. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I believe, as far as the NTC Commission is concerned, uh, we've conducted our business. I would thank commissioners. You've all had a long day. You deserve a good night's rest whenever the hell you get home. <laughs> so drive safely, okay? And the ABAG Executive Board is adjourned to our September meeting. Thank you. <laughs>